Let's turn in the Word of God, please, to the book of 2 Samuel and the chapter number 12. The book of 2 Samuel and the chapter number 12. Are you turning to the place? A few of you were asking me this morning uh, as to how much of the translation of the New Testament we have completed uh, into the Baga language. Well, just to um, let you know uh, roughly where we're at, we have about 40% of the New Testament that has been completed and in print and now available for the people. The remaining 60% we uh, have well underway for the final consultant check uh, for to be approved for, for printing. And uh, we trust that by the end of next year, in the will of the Lord, to have the New Testament completed. And we do thank you for those of you who have followed our work with great interest over the years. And uh, we know that at the lifeboat here, you have faithfully prayed for us and prayed for the translation of God's Word. And it's as a result of your prayers that we have seen the progress that we have and that these people are receiving more of God's Word that they've never had before. So we thank you again in the Savior's name. Let's turn uh, then to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we'll commence at the verse number 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was kindled greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives um, before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. If you want to turn also over to Psalm 51, keeping your finger in that same chapter there, Second Samuel chapter 12, but turn over to Psalm 51. And just a few verses from the verse number one. David here. Praying to God, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, 
and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's just bow for a brief word of prayer. Let's ask God to speak to us now in the remaining moments of this meeting. Lord, we thank Thee for the privilege of being found together here in Thine house once again around the Word of God, and we thank Thee for Thy truth that we have been singing in these hymns that Thy servant has sang in, 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 in song. We thank Thee, Lord, for the, the truth of Thy Word and the truth of the Gospel. And Lord, as we're met together once again in this house of God, and uh, Lord, as we've gathered here, as Lord, uh, sinners are, are amongst us, Lord, that know Thee not. We ask, O God, that by Thy Spirit Thou would speak tonight. I pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost upon my life, upon my lips. I pray for an anointing upon the ears of all who hear. Lord, speak to the unsaved. Speak to Thy people tonight. Lord, challenge us afresh. Lord, in the regard to the whole issue of sin, and Lord, we pray that there may be none of us that will treat the issue of sin lightly, but see it as Thou dost see it, to abhor it as Thou dost abhor it, and to flee from it in these days, and to live for Thee. Lord, be with us now. Shut us in with Thyself. Do us good, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked this morning at David's terrible fall into sin in the 11th chapter there of the book of 2 Samuel, the giant of lust that overcame David. And we saw how his sin led him to a point where he was being led deeper and deeper into the grip of sin, where his heart had become hard and indeed insensitive to the Lord. But we ended up by saying that God didn't leave David there. I said to someone at the end of the meeting, it was a sad place we left David in this morning. But thank God the story doesn't end there. Thank God that God dealt with David, as terrible as his fall was, God dealt with him, bringing him to his senses. Uh, We read there in chapter 12 of Nathan's parable, of the rich man taking the poor man's lamb, of David's reaction that this man must die. And then Nathan's very, very pointed words to David, thou art the man. Thou art the man. And it's interesting to note here that David didn't react in anger to the prophet's accusation. He didn't make any attempt to deny or excuse or justify his sin He freely admitted in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. The arrow of conviction had pierced his heart and had done its work. David's conscience was now awakened and he was caused to realize the seriousness of his guilt. I want us just to consider three things here uh, tonight. First of all, I want us to consider David's repentance. David's repentance. Here in 2 Samuel, we are not told anything about the deep exercises of David's heart as he passed through this experience of repenting of his sin. But there are a number of Psalms which are known as the penitential Psalms uh, where we have recorded the the experiences of David's heart as he uh, passed through this great experience of deep repentance for his sin. And the two main ones are Psalm 51 that we read from earlier and Psalm 32. 
Psalm 51 was the earlier one. And in this psalm, we see the, the depths of David's anguish and sorrow for his sin, the, the reality of his repentance. This is evident in nearly every verse, and I would encourage you to go home and read Psalm 51 in that light. We see the, the sorrow that he felt, the desires that he had within his heart as he, as he, as he seeks God for his mercy, as he pours out his heart in true humility before God and sues God for his mercy. In verses 2 to 3 of Psalm 51, he talks about three things. He talks about his iniquity, his transgression, and his sin. David freely acknowledged that he had committed iniquity, that he had committed transgression, and that he had committed sin. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're not saved, if you're ever going to be saved, then you need to repent of your sin. And to repent of your sin, you've got to realize and acknowledge that you have committed iniquity, that you have committed transgression, and that you have sinned against the Lord. The word iniquity means perversion or distortion. Perversion or distortion. You see, David recognized that he had acted unjustly, he had dealt crookedly, that he had committed a very wicked crime. And dear friend, if you're going to be saved, you need to acknowledge that you have committed iniquity. In other words, that you have committed wicked crimes against the Lord. Now, maybe you're here tonight and the crimes that you have committed are not the type of crimes that we're going to hear on our news tomorrow morning. But my dear friend, in the eyes of God, and this is what you've got to realize, is that you may not have committed any of the crimes that we hear of on our news bulletins, but my dear friend, you have sinned, you have committed iniquity, you have transgressed in thought, word, and in deed. And if you're ever going to be saved, if you're ever going to repent of your sin, and you've got to acknowledge that you have committed wicked crimes against the Lord. The word transgression there in the Hebrew means rebellion, rebellion. David recognized that he had revolted against, that he had rebelled against God and his holy moral standard. You see, in the eyes of the world tonight, whenever people transgress, it's not a very serious thing. The eyes of the world, it's not counted as something very serious. But friends, in the eyes of God tonight, every transgression that you have committed, every transgression of his holy law is a rebellion in your heart against God himself. You've got to realize and acknowledge that. The word sin means missing the mark. Missing the mark. David recognized that he had miserably failed to reach the standard that God requires that is absolute perfection. And maybe you're here tonight and you think that you're not such a bad person, that you have tried to live the best life you can, that you've tried to do your best, you've tried to follow the laws of God. My dear friend, I want to remind you from the Word of God that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have fallen short of God's perfect, holy standard. In the eyes of people, in your own eyes, you might think that you're not such a bad person, but oh, my dear friend, as David recognized here, you need to recognize that you have sinned, that you have missed God's holy standard that he requires. So David acknowledged here his iniquity, his transgression, and his sin. In verse 4, he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You see, David recognized the true nature of his sin, that it was against God. His sin was against God. Yes, he had sinned against his own body, against his own soul. He had sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba. He had sinned against his kingdom, against his own family. And no doubt all of that humbled David. 
But the thing that David mourns over the most, the thing that causes him the most sorrow here is that he realized that his sin that he had committed in, in, in murdering Uriah and taking his wife, that this sin was against God. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. We live in a day when the gospel is being made cheap for many of our evangelical pulpits. People are exhorted to come to Christ to receive a new life, to receive happiness and joy and peace, contentment and fulfillment. It all centers around us and, and what we can get. My dear friends, many of those responding in our uh, meetings in these days have little sense of the fact that they have sinned and that that sin is against God. My dear friends, it is no wonder we have so much shallowness in our churches in these days and amongst the professing people of God. We have got to really question if people have ever been brought to the point where they have really seen their sin and that their sin is against God, that against God of this sin. But I tell you, friend, when someone is brought to that point, where they realize that I have sinned against Almighty God, that these acts of sin that I have committed, they're, they're against God, they're against His majesty. My, when someone is brought to that point, oh, I tell you, there will be true and genuine repentance and turning from sin. David recognized as he repented here of his sin that his sin was against God. In verse 5, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He acknowledges the fact that he has a sinful, fallen nature, that all his acts of sin, indeed his act of, of taking Bathsheba, of, of murdering her husband, that these acts had come from that sinful nature, that sinful heart that was within him. Someone has said that until we see sin in the fountain of the heart, we shall never truly mourn over it in the life and conversation. Friends, repentance begins by acknowledging that we have a sinful heart within us that is a fountain of all evil. Dear friend, do you recognize tonight, as you said in this meeting, that you have a sinful heart that is capable of doing every evil and wicked deed that we hear of on our news in these days? It is only by the providence of, and the mercy and the grace of God that people are kept from allowing all that filth and evil that's within the human heart to, to, to spew out in the life and to be lived out in all its fullness. My dear friends, we have got to realize, we've got to realize that we have a sinful heart within us as good as we think we are. We are born with that sinful nature, and it's from that sinful heart, that heart that the Bible says is desperately wicked. It's from that heart that issue all the acts of sin that we commit. So we see David's repentance here. Read through Psalm 51, you will see the reality, the sincerity, the depth of David's repentance, his broken heartedness as he, as he mourns over his sin, as he acknowledges it before God. So we have David's repentance here. But secondly, we have David's forgiveness. David's forgiveness. In Psalm 51 that we read here, David prays for a number of things. He prays in verse 1 that his sin may be blotted out. He prays in verse 2 that he may be washed thoroughly from his sin. Verse 7, he prays that he may be purged and washed whiter than the snow, like, a, like a, a leper being cleansed of his leprosy. Verse 10, he prayed for a, a clean heart. In verse 12, he prayed that the, they might have restored to him the joy of his salvation. These are the things that David prayed for in Psalm 51. But in Psalm 32, we have the answer that God gave to David and, and to these prayers that he prayed here in Psalm 51. The answer that the God of all grace, who's ever open and willing to receive the truly repentant sinner, the answer that God gave to these prayers and to these cries of David here. 
Spurgeon, in his introductory remarks to Psalm 32, he said, probably his deep repentance over his great sin was followed by such blissful peace that he was led to pour out his spirit in the soft music of this choice song. He starts off by saying, blessed, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Blessed words. David is here celebrating the happiness, the joy of the one who knows that he has been fully pardoned for all his sin. He knows and knows beyond all shadow of a doubt that his transgression has been totally forgiven. His sin has been covered by the precious blood of Christ, never to be again seen by the all-seeing eye, that his iniquity will never be imputed to him, never ever be put to his account. Folks, that is a very, very blessed place to be. To be able to say from your heart tonight, blessed, happy is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. My dear friends, I'm glad that I can stand before you tonight. Indeed, I couldn't stand here tonight and preach this glorious gospel if I didn't have the assurance in my heart, if I couldn't say with David here, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. If I didn't know that blessedness as a reality in my own heart and life tonight, then I couldn't stand here and preach this wonderful gospel to you. But thank God on the authority of God's word tonight, I can stand here and I can say, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven to know that my sins, my iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last for my sins are all covered by the blood. Thank God for this glorious gospel. There's no message like it in all the world. Listen to the messages of, of, of religions and the, 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 what they're trying to say. Folks, there's nothing that can even remotely touch this glorious gospel that we preach tonight that offers to you and to me the blessed assurance that we can know our sins forgiven. Our sins blotted out, removed as far from us as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against us, to lay our head upon the pillow at night, to go forth into each new day with all the uncertainties of life, and to be able to say and to know that our sins are forgiven, blotted out, never ever to be remembered against us anymore. This was David's experience here. Whenever he confessed, in verse 13 of 2 Samuel 12, I have sinned. Nathan's reply was, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. How wonderful to know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. Thank God for that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood. Thank God, lose all their sins. Lose all their sins. I wonder tonight, friends, have you plunged beneath that crimson tide? Do you know tonight, as you sit here, as you leave this meeting tonight, do you know, know beyond all shadow of a doubt, that every sin, every transgression, every iniquity that you've ever committed, that it's all cleansed, forgiven, and that you can know that you're free from all the condemnation of sin. You can face life, death, eternity, and know that all is well. David's repentance, David's forgiveness. But we see here that while David was completely forgiven for his sin, cleansed, never to be remembered against him anymore. Yet there were consequences that David had to face. And I want to speak to the people of God tonight because we see here very clearly in this incident, David's chastening. Look at verse 10 of Second Samuel chapter 12, the words of Nathan. 
Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Verse 14, Howbeit, because of this deed thou, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. You know, some people think it's strange that on the one hand God forgave David for his sin completely, and yet on the other hand, he seems here to be punishing him, telling him that the sword would never depart from his house, that this child was going to die. What is the explanation for that? The explanation, friends, is the chastening hand of God. God was not punishing David here, but God was chastening him for his sin. You know, friends, I had discovered that the message of God chastening his people is not a popular message amongst God's people. Indeed, some don't even believe in it. But friends, we cannot avoid seeing here what God said and what David experienced after his sin and his terrible fall. The Bible teaches us very, very clearly, folks, that for us as the people of God, sin is not a light and a trivial matter, and that God does not treat sin in the lives of his people, those who have been forgiven, those who have had their sins all blotted out. God does not treat their sin as a light and a trivial matter. God does chasten his people. It's important that we understand the difference. There's a fundamental difference between punishment and chastisement. This will seriously affect how we live our lives as Christians. See, God punishes his enemies, the unsaved, the unconverted, but he chastens his people. God cannot ever punish his people those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, God cannot and will never punish them. Why? Because all their sin was laid upon Christ. And we can say tonight, my sin, know the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We can know that our sin will never ever be, uh, we will never ever be punished for our sin because the punishment was laid upon Christ. But God will chasten us as his people whenever we commit sin. You see, God only punishes the unsaved, but he chastens his people. In the one, he's acting as a judge, in the other, he's acting as a father. In the, the, God's punishment flows from, the, from, his, from his anger and his wrath against sin, but his chastisement flows from his love to us as his people. David, as a child of God, was not being punished for his sin here, but he was being chastened, corrected, disciplined by his loving Heavenly Father. Hebrews 12 reminds us, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God chastens his people. God uses the rod upon his people to discipline them, to bring about certain results in their lives, to, to, to bring about the fruits of righteousness in their lives. You see, God had some things to teach David here and to teach us through him in regard to his sin. He had to teach David that sin does bring consequences. And so he chastened David. He allowed this son that was born to Bathsheba to, to die. He, he allowed grievous trouble to 
come into the family of David. And all this taught David that sin is no light and trivial matter in the eyes of God. We do reap what we sow. Galatians 6, written to the people of God, said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Psalm 99 and verse 8, We are told, Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. God forgave them, but he took vengeance of their inventions. There are many examples of this throughout Scripture. Exodus 32, that grievous sin of the children of Israel when they made the golden calf whenever Moses was up the mountain. Grievous, grievous sin. But whenever Moses cried to God on, on, on behalf of Moses' intercession, God forgave his people. He told Moses that, that he had forgiven them for that grievous sin. But God still plagued the people, and many of them died. And in David's case here, God forgave him as regards to eternal death. What did he say in verse 13? The Lord hath also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David was not going to experience eternal death or separation from God because of his sin. But God did take vengeance of David's inventions. Look at verse 9. Wherefore hast thou, des hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of his son. <laughs> Folks, this is a very, very solemn warning to David here that he must reap as he had sown. You see, he had caused Uriah to be killed by the sword. Now the sword was never going to depart from his house. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba, defiling her. Now his own wives were going to be defiled. How true the words of Christ are in Matthew 7 and 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Again, we have many examples of this throughout Scripture. The Sodomites, they burn with lusts. What happened to them? Fire came from heaven, destroyed them, fire and brimstone. Jacob deceived his father by means of the skin of a, of a, of a kid. In turn, Jacob's own sons deceived him by dipping the, the coat of Joseph in the blood of a kid. Pharaoh had cruelly ordered all the male infants of the children of Israel to be drowned. What happened to him? He in turn was drowned along with all his hosts. Nadab and Abihu, the, the sons of Aaron, offered strange fire before the Lord. What happened to them? Fire from the Lord consumed and destroyed them. Folks, this shows to us that we will reap what we sow. We do not preach a soft message tonight. Friends, we will reap what we sow. For us as the people of God, we need to take heed that we will reap what we sow. Dear unsaved, unconverted, you sow a life of sin, a life of Christ rejection. You will reap the consequences, eternal misery, eternal separation from God. And so we see here that the reaping began in the life of David. The chastening hand of God came upon him. Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. God had told him, the Lord, for his own glory, had to show his great displeasure against his sin. Jeremiah 2 and 19 says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. God has said through Nathan 
uh, to David, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. Folks, it was going to be through those nearest and dearest to David that he was going to learn by bitter experience that it is indeed an evil and a bitter thing to depart from the living God. Folks, may God give every one of us a holy abhorrence of sin. In days when sin is being treated very lightly, even by the people of God, may God give us a holy abhorrence and hatred of sin, the same holy God of heaven who has given us his word, set his holy moral standards before us, has not changed and will not change. He still hates sin. Sin will damn you if you're not saved. Sin will bring the chastening hand of God upon you if you're a child of God tonight. David's family, we see that God used a method to a method to discipline him. And it wasn't by sending a fire from heaven to uh, burn up his palace or an earthquake to, 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 to flatten it. He didn't send a flash of lightning to kill his sons or the ground to open up to, to swallow them. No, it was by means of his own carrying out his own moral laws that God disciplined and chasing David. It was simply the natural consequence of his own sin being worked out, reaping what he had sown. You see, David had flown in the face of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. He had despised this commandment. He had taken another man's wife. As a result, the women of his own house were going to be defiled, his own son going into them in the light of the open sun. David had flown in the face of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. He had, he despised this command. He had Uriah killed by the sword. And so now he had blood upon his own hands. As a result, the blood of his own sons was going to be shed. He had flew in the face of the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. He despised this commandment, lusted after Uriah's wife until he took her. As a result, his own son lusted after his, his daughter until he raped her. You see, David reaped exactly as he had sown. He had sown to the flesh, and now he was of the flesh, reaping corruption even in his own family. The harvest that David was reaping, friends, was tragic. It was tragic. There's nothing more painful for any parent and to see their own sins reappearing in the lives of their children. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, we have recorded two of the most horrible crimes that ever spoiled the peace and the blessing of any family. Ammon, the firstborn heir to the throne, groveling in his own sinful lusts and desires, defiles his half-sister. Absalom, her full brother, after biding his time, revenges this disgraceful behavior and murders his own brother. Alexander McLaren says, David saw the ghastly reflection of his unbridled passion in his eldest son's foul crime and of his murderous craft in his second son's bloody revenge. Folks, as we close tonight, if you get nothing else from this message, get this, we reap what we sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you're here and you're not saved, perhaps you've heard the gospel, but time and time again you reject it. You say, it's not for me. It's all right for others, but it's not for me. My dear friend, you live a life of rejecting Christ, keeping him outside your heart's door and outside your, your life. My dear friend, you will reap the consequences. Because it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Or oh, you can live your life as you want to and as you please. But oh, my dear friend, you will reap one day the judgment of God. You will reap eternal damnation for all your sin and Christ's rejection. 
And so the, the, the plea of the gospel tonight is to turn from your sin like David acknowledged his sin. Acknowledge your sin tonight. Turn from it. Know what it is to be saved from the wrath of God upon you for your sin. And child of God in this meeting tonight, oh, be careful how you live. Be careful how you conduct your life. Because like David, even though our sin is forgiven, never be remembered against you. But my dear friend, if you live and follow a course of sin, sin in your life, you will reap the chastening hand of God just like David bitterly experienced the chastening hand of God in his own family. And so you too will experience the chastening hand of God in your life. May God help us. May God give us all that holy hatred, a holy hatred of sin and all that it will bring into our lives. May God help us to flee from it tonight. Flee to the precious blood of Christ if you're not saved. Oh, that precious cleansing blood of Christ that alone can cleanse you from sin, save you from the wrath and the judgment of God. Flee to that fountain tonight. Be washed and be cleansed for his sake.